Hello, and welcome to episode eight of the Sci Fi Podcast. From Bloomington, Indiana, I'm Nick Zoutra. Today on the podcast, we have a very well known guest in the philosophy of science and in philosophy in general, Dr. Edouard Machery. Edouard is a distinguished professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh, the director of the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. He's a member of the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition with the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, and an adjunct research professor in the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. Edward's research focuses on the philosophical issues raised by psychology and cognitive neuroscience with a special interest in concepts, moral psychology, the relevance of evolutionary biology for understanding cognition, modularity, the nature, origins, and ethical significance of prejudiced cognition, the foundation of statistics, and the methods of psychology and cognitive neuroscience. He is also involved in the development of experimental philosophy, having published several noted articles in this field. Aside from Edward's truly unique upbringing and success in philosophy of science, which you will hear about in a minute, Edward shares with us a great opportunity for current and future scholars interested in the philosophy of science, which is visiting the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. The Center for Philosophy of Science is devoted to philosophy of science in all its forms. It was founded in 1960 by Adolf Grunbaum, and its first activities included the annual lecture series and a supporting series of volumes. In the decades following, center activities were expanded to include a visiting fellows program through which philosophers of science reside in the center for a term or academic year to talk philosophy and undertake their own research. So if you were to visit the center through their Visiting Fellows program, you would have access to a full calendar of talks, workshops, conferences, and other activities, access with instructor permission to graduate seminars taught in the departments of philosophy and history and philosophy of science, and the company of other Visiting Fellows, resident fellows in many departments of the University of Pittsburgh, and center associates drawn from other universities in the Pittsburgh area. But most importantly, if you were to visit the center, be it even for a short-term stay, such as for a workshop attendance or to present at a conference, you'd be exposed to a stimulating and friendly environment in which to hear about philosophy of science, to talk about philosophy of science, to think about philosophy, and to create philosophy of science. So for more information about the center and its upcoming events, check out their website, which I've included the link to in this week's show notes. Now, moving on to the interview. It was a great pleasure getting to chat with Edward and to hear his story. I do hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed chatting with him. So without further ado, let's bring in Edward. Let's start back at the beginning. Where uh, where did you grow up, Edward? So I'm French, as you okay. may have noticed by now. And, um, hmm. and I grew up in France, in fact. I spent most of my use on the west part of France in a place called Vendée. It's, uh, and the city is called Les Sables de Lonne, which is on, on the shore, on the Atlantic shore. Really oh. small city. You, you would not have heard of it. Um, if you were French, you may, mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a beach resort. So people go there during the summer. It's not very expensive. So most French have spent at least a summer there. Um, oh, okay. but it's, it's, it's not very remarkable from, any other point of view except for the beach. So it was, then I went, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh no, I was uh, going to say is so. You grew up in the place where those in uh, those from France vacationed in France. That's exactly that's that, that's, <laughs> yeah. ex that's exactly right. So yeah. you can imagine that kind of place, really small uh, in winter, not much to do, much mm -hmm. laughter during the summer, very exciting time for a young pair, for a teenager or a child. Very nice, very nice. And oh, so what were you interested in uh, growing up? So I was. Mostly, I did, so I did my high school there, and then mm -hmm. I left. Uh, and I was mostly doing math, uh, mathematics. Is uh, I thought I would become a mathematician. I, I've always wanted to be an academic, to 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 be a professor. Always since I'm a, since I'm a child, and um, I'm not I'm not sure not sure exactly why I knew. Yeah, I I'm curious about that. <laughs> how, how did that? Was it at seven years old? Were you thinking, oh, I, I see these. See these men and women. This is something I want to do. Or uh... yeah, I think there's a bit of that. Um, there's a book. I don't remember who the author is. A novel called Changing Places or Trading Places. Mm -hmm. 
something like that by a British uh, novelist. And it's about the academic world in the 1970s. And oh, the, basic, yeah. the basic plot is somebody from the UK gets a one-year appointment in Berkeley in San Francisco, and somebody from San Francisco gets one year, a one-year appointment in the UK. And mm-hmm. it just describes the life of an academic and, I, and with a lot of travels and conferences and and. I read that book when I was really quite young, and somehow I, I just thought it was a, a wonderful life to be able to travel like that everywhere and give just to work on, to do research, work on the life of mine. On the, and, and so I, I really got into the idea that I would become an academic myself. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Um, well, yeah. that's great. That's great. So, uh, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard of this book, but, uh, or uh, as you said, but it sounds, it sounds really interesting. So, well, um, were uh, your folks, your parents, supportive of your academic pursuits, or uh... they, were, they were? Yeah, they were. Uh, I, you know, in France, uh, as you may know, uh, we do philosophy in we, we take philosophy courses in the last year of high school. And oh, I did not know. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's actually uh, an important time in in the, it was at least when I was uh, in high school, an important time in the life of a high school student, and. They were a bit surprised when I decided to switch from mathematics as my sure. main research interest to, 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 to philosophy. Um, but still, they were still very supportive. Uh, you know, they thought that they was a, uh, an interesting uh, life. They agreed with me and uh, they knew I loved to read and I loved to do intellectual things. So they, were, um, yeah, they, they never really objected to uh, me trying to have that kind of career. Okay, well that's that's good to hear. And so, where um, after after high school, where where did you f- find yourself? Uh, were you studying so in French, France? Yeah. yeah, the French system is very weird. So um, we have two tracks, so to speak. On the one hand, you can go to university, and on the other hand, you can go to what we call les grandes écoles, which can translate roughly as the higher schools which are uh, research and teaching institutions which are very prestigious. Uh, mm-hmm. And to go into those, you need to spend, you usually need to spend two or three years of training. And so you finish your high school and then you have two or three years of training to take an exam mm-hmm. to be accepted in one of these institutions. So what I did at the end of my high school in Les Sables de Lons, a small place in Vendée, I did what all French people do. Uh, what all French people want to do is a very mm-hmm. stereotypical things to do. I went to Paris. Uh, uh-huh. you, know, you go from the province uh, to to the to the main city to uh, to Paris. So, and sure. I spent two, two three years uh, in 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 Paris training for one of these uh, grandes écoles called uh, l'école normale supérieure. Um, it's where. If you know a bit of French philosophy, you may have heard of it. It's where Sartre and Foucault. Oh, okay. All of these famous French philosophers got their training, and for some of them, taught. Uh, so Althusser taught there for most of his life. Foucault taught there for quite quite a long time, um, and a bit before Canguilhem also taught there a little bit. Um, so it has a long. It's a very prestigious, yeah, and it's a yeah, yeah, place for French people. Yeah. So how did you like it there? Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, it was actually. Um, um, I have only wonderful memories of, of that part of my life. The way it works is that you get in, it's a very selective exam. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, maybe 2,000 people, 1,000 people try to get in, the takes 50, 60 people. Oh, wow. Now, the, and the, the reason why it's so selective is that you are paid while you're there. Okay. So, so the, the government gives you, you become um, uh, uh, a functionnaire, you actually a civil servant, mm-hmm. uh, and you start working for the state despite the fact that you're a student. So you get a very generous stipend Plus a place to live in Paris, uh, so you know it's it's a wonderful, wonderful way of uh, supporting uh, young people, and there's no exam, there's no uh, uh, program. It's mm. up you. It's up to you to do whatever you want. So you've got four years of your life, and you you, you can take seminars if you want. Uh, you can take math courses, biology courses. You can dedicate your time to art. Um, and there's no exam at the end. There's no degree even. It's just you've been to the Economale Supérieure. Now, at the same time, you must take some degrees elsewhere at the university to have a formal degree. But mm-hmm. really, the Economale Supérieure is, is meant to help you develop your own curriculum, develop your own research interests. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to, uh, 
to grow up from an intellectual point of view. Uh, so I was extremely happy to be there. It gave me a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted. That's, that's phenomenal. So how did you see your, your intellectual development uh, blossom at this during these four years? So it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, um, I did a lot of different things in many ways. I was sort of searching for um, what I really wanted to do in, 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 in my life from an intellectual point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't been exposed to analytic philosophy very much. I mm. had a history of philosophy, Kant, Leibniz, uh, uh, ancient philosophy quite a lot. And uh, I knew I didn't want to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. I, knew, I knew I didn't want to, to specialize in history of philosophy. So it wasn't very much what Americans call continental philosophy going on, just a little bit, a little bit of phenomenology. And I knew also I didn't want to do phenomenology. Uh, so the, I spent quite a fair amount of time of these four years looking for um, research topics or things which I, which I thought were exciting, mm-hmm. new, and, and groundbreaking. So I, I touched a bit, uh, I did a bit of aesthetics, so I, I, I did a lot of history of art at the time. I did a fair amount of logic. Uh, you see, things which are very little in common because you could do it. Yeah. Uh, I did a fair amount of logic at the time. And uh, a bit of philosophy of science, but mostly French philosophy of science. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, Conquilem, that, that tradition, the French tradition in philosophy of science. So, so, adds, yeah. so for those who are, might, might be not too familiar, so how does, how does the tradition in French philosophy of science compare with, you know, I'd say, um, I don't know, the, in the UK, that in the US philosophy of science? Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, it's much more historical in in many ways and it uh describes um in a sense the evolution of 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 concepts Hmm. uh um more from an historical point of view um um i mean foucault for example is in some ways the hair of the tradition. So his work is partly about the evolution of the concept of, his early work, the evolution of the concept of, as, as, as he calls it, madness. Yeah, uh, yeah. And how it develops, uh, uh, influenced by scientific interest, social interest. And he, he's in many ways a hair of the French tradition. So there's more emphasis also on the process of creating science, on, mm-hmm. uh, for example, the role of imagination, uh, uh, on how concepts get to be developed and, and adapted to, circum- to circumstances. So that's, in a sense, I, w- I would say, uh, with very broad strokes, uh, uh, a way to describe the French uh, tradition in philosophy of science. Uh, the American or English tradition, uh, at least at the time, uh, was more uh, uh, interested in providing um, explicit accounts of what counts as an explanation or yeah. explicit yeah. accounts of what counts as providing confirmation for, uh, for something. So uh, the notion of explanation, how to explain is the notion of confirmation of, or empirical support, how to make sense of that notion, how to describe it. And so it's, it is slightly more normative, even though so it mm-hmm. has also a descriptive aspect, while the French tradition is, I would say, slightly more descriptive and slightly less normative. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so did you find yourself? So, w- were you couching yourself for more in the French tradition while you were there? Or That's right. yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. okay. But I was also looking for alternatives. Uh, yeah. During most of my time in France, I was also trying to look for new ways of doing philosophy, um, which I found actually when I went to the U.S. Uh, during my time at the Economale Supérieure, I spent a year at Boston College oh, okay. and, and teaching French which gave me an opportunity to do philosophy. I went to MIT, Harvard, BU, and learned a lot about uh, American philosophy during that year. And that so, changed my life. So you did a one year, um, was this uh, after the four years or was this during like an exchange? It was, it was an exchange during Oh, fantastic. Year. But yeah. just getting immersed in those other communities must have been really exciting too. Oh, it was incredible. Uh, it just, in a sense, as I said, it, it changed my life. It changed my thinking about how to do philosophy and when I came back to France after that one year uh, in Boston, mm-hmm. I wanted to do something entirely different. I really <laughs> wanted to become, uh, to be the type of philosopher that I've observed in, in the USA. Um, 
Yeah, so I was extremely excited. So was this the general philosophy of science, or was this something different that you that you saw? Like, what what, what I could ask you know a couple of, two things. Like, yeah. one, what, what what motivated you as you said to search out new ways of doing philosophy? Like, were you dissatisfied mm-hmm. with something? And then two, what is it? What is this new way of doing it that you wanted to become? Yeah, good. Uh, I was a bit dissatisfied. Uh, I was dissatisfied mostly because I felt that what had attracted me to philosophy in the first place, meaning argumentation, mm-hmm. a form of rigor, which was different from, from mathematical rigor, but still rigorous, and was somehow getting lost in um, uh, the history of philosophy, in phenomenology, and to some extent, to a lesser extent, but to some extent, in the uh, French tradition of philosophy of science. Uh, that may be severe, and uh, it's probably an exaggeration, but that's the way I felt it at the time. Sure. And what I discovered in, in the USA was a culture of doing philosophy, which was much more focused on argumentation, on, uh, on providing clear arguments for clear thesis. And uh, in a sense, the reason why I went to philosophy uh, uh, I discovered it again uh, why, when I traveled to um, to the USA, and that's the main mm-hmm. reason why I decided to change. It, it had nothing to do with content, nothing mm-hmm. to do with philosophy of science. It has everything to do with a culture of argumentation, a culture of trying to be as clear as possible to lay out positions and trying to be as precise as possible to explain this position and as uh, as uh, uh, careful as possible in defending them, uh, and that's I thought was had been getting lost somewhat in French philosophy, mm-hmm. and uh, I just thought the American culture of philosophy was very much oriented around these uh, uh, ideas and, and 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 goals. Fantastic. So, okay. So after uh, your exchange and your fr- um, and your your time in uh, you know I, I guess prim- what would you call it? Is it a primary school in uh, your your first time at university? Where did you uh, go on to? Was, this, uh, was there an immediate transition to graduate school? That's right, yes. Yeah. So I finished uh, L'Ecole Normale Supérieure, and uh, then uh, I was lucky to get uh, funding to do a PhD uh, in uh, philosophy. And I had decided by the time to do something in philosophy of mind, okay. philosophy of psychology, and for various reasons. The first one, because um, um, all of the courses had Sat on, sat on when I was in the U.S. Some in philosophy of mind w- struck me as really being very good. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the late 1990s, so there was still a lot of debates in uh, empirically informed philosophy of mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Rutgers School was still very influential in that uh, uh, tradition. And um, also, uh, French analytic philosophy at the time was in part dedicated to philosophy of mind. So the Institut Jean Nico in Paris was extremely mm-hmm. strong in philosophy of mind. So it was for me a very good place to find minds and possibly advisors who had the same interests, the same views about how to do philosophy uh, uh, if, I, if I worked in philosophy of mind. So I decided to work in philosophy of mind and to do a, a dissertation in philosophy of mind, but in empirically informed philosophy of mind. So philosophy of mind that was at the intersection of philosophy and cognitive science. That's fantastic. Now, this is something I, um, before we go on to the story, do, do you um, find a distinction or a useful distinction between uh, empirically informed philosophy of mind and philosophy of cognitive science? Uh, are that? Oh, yeah, that, very much so. Yeah. Uh, I, I've moved so empirically informed philosophy of mind at the end of the day just is philosophy of mind that is an enriching some arguments with um, uh, results sure. from the sciences. And um, uh, philosophy of cognitive science is really quite different. I mean, it itself can take various forms. Some of it is about the foundations of um, uh, cognitive science, taking some notions in cognitive science and trying to explicate those notions. Some of it is philosophy of science applied to uh, cognitive science. Yep. In the same way as that Philosophy of biology sometimes is just philosophy of science applied to uh, to biology, uh, but I, I think it's it's clear that from uh, an intellectual point of view and also from a, a sociological point of view, empirically informed uh, philosophy of mind and philosophy of cognitive science are uh, somewhat distinct. It's, yes, 
the questions are not the same. The people working in two areas talk to one another, but they, they, they tend to work, uh, um, you know, they don't exact, always work in the same mm-hmm. circles, for example. Yeah, great, great. So, so you started in philosophy of mind. How did you make the, I, su- I suppose, somewhat of a transition toward more yep. philosophy of science? So the topic of my dissertation was concepts, and mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, and at the time, concepts was uh, a field that drew from philo- that, that attracted philosophers of mind with very little empirical interests, like oh, little, like Chris Peacock, for example, mm-hmm. uh, somebody who has some interest in the census and know some psychology, but his research and thought isn't inspired by. Uh, I would say, I think it's fair to say that by psychology or cognitive science. On the other hand, it also drew some people like uh, the Churchland, like Paul Churchland mostly, who, whose work was very much influenced by the growth of connectionism and the first uh, uh, neuroscientific models of concept acquisition. So there's a field which has actually a mix of traditional philosophers of mind, uh, people like Jerry Fodor, who mm-hmm. were had traditional interests, but also, of course, knew a fair amount of cognitive science. And people like Paul Churchland, who, of course, knew a lot of uh, cognitive science and neuroscience. So it was easy to move from yeah. traditional questions to approaches to the issues of concepts that were, that were in a sense, much more uh, influenced by questions in the sciences. I was So very quickly, I got disappointed uh, by some of the more traditional ways of framing questions about concepts. And I thought there was a lot of work to be done on concepts that were more inspired by psychology or by the psychology of concepts. So I moved away from philosophy of mind to, mm-hmm. towards issues more, uh, I would say, uh, in philosophy of cognitive science. Yeah, so I see. Um, so it was um, in your book, Doing Without Concepts, was this some of the work, was this in, initially inspired by some of the work you were doing on your dissertation? Or was That's this. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah. So it's partly, um, uh, I mean, a few years, uh, there, was, there were a few years between my dissertation and the publication sure. of the book, five years, in fact. And so okay. I, had, I had time to rewrite the book extensively. But the basic ideas, the basic arguments uh, uh, are drawn from the dissertation. That's right. Fantastic. And maybe could you give us sort of the general rundown of uh, the main argument for, uh, of the book? Sure, absolutely. So the book focuses on, on the notion of concept in psychology. So it's, it's a sense where it's, it's a project in the philosophy of psychology. The goal here is to make a useful contribution to, to a bit of science, the so psychology of concepts, psychology of concept acquisition. And uh, the main claim of, of the book is that the notion of concept is in fact, uh, uh, should in fact be eliminated from, hmm. from psychology. Uh, why is that? Um, uh, it's, it's a very simple argument. I start with uh, um, uh, showing or arguing that most psychologists and many philosophers who work with them take the notion of take concepts to be what philosophers call a natural kind. Namely, it's a group of entities or things or objects that have many properties in common and, mm-hmm. that, and, and because they share a co- some kind of causal mechanism. So they have many properties in common. And uh, of course, science, of course, often cares about such kinds, right? Scientists often try to identify the proper natural kinds in that domain. And um, so I I, I try to show that that psychologists assume that concepts form such a kind. And then I spend most of the book arguing that uh, that's a mistake, in fact. And when one looks closely at the science Mm -hmm. of 30 years of concept acquisition, concept use uh, uh, for categorization, for induction, uh, one comes to the realization that concepts, in fact, uh, can be extremely diverse from one another, mm. and that there is no, there, is, there are very few generalizations that are true of all concepts. So the class of concept itself is not what philosopher calls, uh, what philosophers call a natural kind, and that, so that's that's a key step in the argument. And sure, from sure. that, and from that conclusion, I try to argue that in reaction to that, we have grounds for eliminating the notion of concept from uh, cognitive science. So that's, that's a basic sketch. Of, oh, of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do, how has the, uh, the book been received? I know it's been out for several years. Yeah, uh, it's been in 2009. Uh, it got a lot of attention. I, I think it, it, mm-hmm. it was very well received, uh, both by philosophers and, and psychologists. And I was mm-hmm. very happy, actually, to have 
an impact on both fields. In fact, it was one of the goals of, of, of writing the book. I tend to view philosophy of psychology or philosophy of science as successful when it manages to have an impact on, on some scientific activity. And so, our, so the book was um, reasonably influential in, in, in psychology, uh, uh, behavior and brain sciences, uh, an important journal in cognitive, in cognitive science and in neuroscience, had uh, dedicated part of an issue to the book. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I wrote a pressy of the book and then 25 or something like that. People responded to the book, wrote, wrote comments on the book, and I responded to their comments, both psychologists, philosophers, a few neuroscientists. Um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion uh, of some of the ideas in the book. Some people in education were interested in some of the ideas also developed in the book. Uh, so there was a bunch of workshops involving psychologists, people working in education, and a few philosophers. So it, it, it has had a very, it, it has a, um, I've, been, I've been very satisfied with the impact the book has had, both on philosophy of mind or philosophy of cognitive science, and equally important, if not more, on psychology and on some scientific fields. That's fantastic. So perhaps you could t- just share with us, you know, you've thought a lot, of, it seemed to be, you seem to be very reflective in terms of how to do philosophy and how to, and how to make it, uh, make a successful contribution to the science. So what is your uh, general strategy in terms of the way you approach philosophy such that it might have a contribution to the science? It's, um, a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the fact is, uh, it's actually is the unusual event that um, philosophers have an impact on on some science. Sure. I, I'm, you know, um, um, I think what's going on in the philosophy of cognitive science is that I and a few others are benefiting from. The, the influence that some older philosophers of psychology and cognitive science have had on cognitive science. Um, what I have in what people I have in mind here are people like Jerry Fodor, for example, or Steve Stitch, or mm-hmm. Alvin Goldman. So all these people have published book 20, 30, uh, sometimes 40 years ago, uh, which have been widely read uh, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. And they've been widely read by scientists, by psychologists. I think one of the outcome of their influence on psychology is that younger philosophers of psychology mm. um, are more likely to be heard uh, by um, psychologists or cognitive scientists or neuroscientists than uh, uh, in other bits, in other fields within the philosophy of science. So I think it's a contingent aspect. It's in part a contingent aspect. Oh, that's aspect interesting. Yeah. Of the philosophy of psychology. Yeah, um, given the history of it. I, yeah, cause, so right. as opposed to, let's say, philosophy of physics or exactly. philosophy, philosophy of biology. Of yeah, yeah. Philosophy of biology is a bit in between, yep. but philosophy of physics is clearly the opposite side where most, most physicists just do not pay very much attention to no, what's no. going on in philosophy of physics. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. And then also, uh, I think what I've done, uh, and I've done that not only for the concept book, but for, for some of my work since then, I try to find most of, not all, but I, th- I would say many of my research topics come from issues in the sciences. Mm-hmm. So I, when I usually write on an issue in philosophy of science, it's an issue that scientists themselves have written about or are concerned with. Um, so I rarely, extremely rarely write on topics in philosophy of science that are drawn from philosophy of science. Sure. They're usually topics that scientists are, are already debating about. And then I'm trying to make a distinct contribution to this debate, bringing the skills we philosophers have, yep. greater clarity, a sense of argumentation, um, and that kind of things. So when you're doing that, would you do you ever consider yourself essentially just doing science, or is it still something you wouldn't want to go that far and so still say you're doing more or conceptual clarity or just different kind of work? I, I think it's very similar to what scientists do when they are uh, reflective. So it's not theorizing about the world. Uh, it's not no. running experiment about the world. It's uh, engaging in a third type of activity where uh, you are in the process of clarifying some specific either concept or specific, some specific notion 
or, or some specific form of insurance or some specific type of explanation. Uh, so providing some clarity about something that lacks clarity. And scientists do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, that, that's part of, of the life of a scientist. But I think it's also a very philosophical activity. Uh, so I would agree. I, I think that's, that's a time where, philosopher, uh, where scientists become, in a way, philosophers of science to make progress. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's a wonderful place where we philosophers of science can join scientists to uh, 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 engage in an activity which is both philosophical and, sci- and, 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 yeah. and scientific. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, great. No, that is very well put. So, so you've been at, so I noticed you, you, it was, I mean, somewhat, you could say somewhat recently had your PhD in 2004, uh, right. And did you uh, immediately join the the faculty at, at Pitt? Or that's right. was, oh, that's fantastic! That's great. Uh, I was lucky. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you remember your transition into the uh, you know uh, the hiring process and how that went along? Um, I I don't have very clear memories. I remember I did not apply to many jobs. Um, mm-hmm. I may only have applied to one job, in fact. Uh, oh, wow. Like, one job. I, I mean, the, the reason was that I had already two postdocs that were oh, lined okay. up with me. One was with Kim Sterelny in Australia for three years working on cultural evolution. And I was doing some psychology at the time at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development mm. in, uh, in Germany, in Berlin. And I had, I had a one or two year postdoc there if I wanted so for me, there was no real rush of, of getting a job. Either postdoc was very exciting, and I would have been very happy to, uh, uh, to, to take one of them. And I just found out that there was this wonderful opportunity at Pitt in philosophy of cognitive science. They were looking for somebody who knew the science, and I, I knew a lot of science. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, well, why not apply for that job, uh, despite having already two postdocs? And, uh, and I, I remember I was in France, I was with my family, and I got this phone call from Sandy Mitchell uh, <laughs> telling, <laughs> telling me that they were interested in bringing me to Pittsburgh. Um, oh, so wow. I was extremely pleased, uh, you can imagine. Uh, and uh, so brought me to Pittsburgh. Things went very well. I thought, I thought the, uh, the department was fantastic. People were extremely nice and, and, and brilliant. Uh, the graduate students were extremely good. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, so, of course, when they made me a job offer, it was uh, very hard uh, not to say no, no. It was very hard not to say yes. <laughs> well, of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, how have you liked it there? You've been there for several years now. Uh, how have you seen the, uh, the department change over the years? Um, so, it has, uh, it, is, it has not changed a lot until recently. Um, okay. a few, um, there's Except for one, in one respect, we hired Majrita Chirimuta, who is yeah. uh, doing philosophy of neuroscience and uh, uh, who um, uh, is about to get tenured, uh, if everything goes well. Uh, Very nice. And uh, uh, so in, for a long time, the department hasn't changed too much, except that we've broadened uh, philosophy of neuroscience and philosophy of cognitive science by hiring her, which was very good for me. Yeah, uh, so that, that has also attracted more uh, graduate students working for the philosophy of cognitive science. When I came here uh, 10, 12 years ago now, uh, I think there was one or two graduate students who were interested. And now there may be maybe a third of the graduate community does philosophy of cognitive science. Okay. Uh, so that has, that has made, that, was, that has been a, uh, a very important change. Um, so that has been the main change. We're in the, pro- the department is about to change quite a lot because in recent years, many of my colleagues have retired. Uh, yeah, are yeah. about to retire. Uh, so uh, Ken Schaffner retired last year. He's emeritus. Mm-hmm. Um, Jim Lennox will retire next year. And Peter McCamber just retired. So oh, the wow, department yeah. I knew is going to be as, is disappearing. So in a three years from now, it, it will be, a, by and large, a new department. Wow. Well, that will be exciting, I suppose. It must be, you know, this is definitely sad to see some of the folks that you've, you know, come to, yep. to know and love and work with. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Well, great. Well, so what's in store for you now? What, what have you uh, been working on lately? So I just finished a book, not in philosophy of science, but in metaphilosophy, which oh, is in the hands of uh, OUP, mm-hmm. and it should be out sometimes this year. It's called Philosophy Within Its Proper Bounds, which Ooh. is a, a criticism of uh, 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 some philosophical projects and some philosophical traditions, arguing that, in fact, there's 
merge in philosophy is that many questions in philosophy for which we are unable to give answers. Uh, and so it's a call for limiting some of our philosophical projects. Um, and it's providing, so that's the negative part of the book. And the positive part of the book mm-hmm. is a defense of conceptual analysis, not oh. traditional conceptual analysis, not new kind. Exactly, new kind. Not Dave Chalmers or Frank Jackson style conceptual analysis, but a new form of conceptual analysis that makes more sense from a naturalistic point of view. Uh, so that's, that's the book which I just finished, should be out uh, next year, and I'm starting a new book on the epistemology of neuroscience. Um, so that's my new project. Yeah, I saw, were you teaching a course on, the, I think I was looking through your teachings. Are you, yes. Did you, how, how did that go? It was at WashU, actually. I spent a semester at Washington University um, a year and a half ago now, uh, or actually two years ago now, um, and it went very well. Uh, so I've got this idea that one of the things philosophers should be doing is take some forms of inference uh, from senses, try to formalize them, or at least to explicate them, to describe them in detail, and then try to assess them. So what I want to do in the book is a form of... Uh, um, uh, uh, rational reconstruction. So Rationbar has this notion of rational reconstruction mm-hmm. and I think that's actually one of the things philosophers of science can do. Identify a practice in science, describe it, and assess it. Um, and so what I want to do in the book is describe rational reconstruction uh, as a way of doing philosophy of science and then illustrate rational reconstruction by looking at uh, the epistemology of neuroscience. And so the graduate seminar was in a sense trying to look at some of the themes that the book will be about. Uh, And it went very well, actually. I think the graduate students enjoyed it. Uh, I took a lot of notes. uh, So part of the book is already uh, written. You just need to uh, spend the next 18 months uh, putting flesh on the ideas. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I imagine you got to work with some of the folks in the PNP program. That's right. That's great. Yeah, what do you think of that program when you were? Oh, it's a it's a a wonderful program. I really love the people there. Uh, It's extremely diverse and extremely strong. Uh, I love the graduate students, which uh, uh, all of whom I, I think are. Um, uh, doing really original and important work, uh, and the faculty, both Cal Craver and John mm-hmm. Dury and Ron Mallon and, and the other ones are all uh, terrific philosophers. They cover a large uh, um, uh, range uh, in the philosophy of cognitive science and neuroscience, so it's a wonderful place to uh, um, uh, get a, a graduate degree. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, I'm looking forward to reading your upcoming book um, mm. <laughs> this sounds very interesting i mean i'm generally interested in meta philosophy myself and mm-hmm. you know as since uh, sort of the theme of this podcast is understanding how to do good philosophy of science we could also look into how to do good philosophy in general so mm-hmm. um and yeah the, the next book epistemology of neuroscience sounds also very interesting uh well so, yeah so we're coming a little bit to the end is there anything uh you'd like to share with uh listeners of the podcast or uh, anything about you know other news of Edouard Machery? <laughs> um, uh, it won't be a news about me, but uh, something you did not mention at the beginning is that uh, for now th- four months, five months, I took over the Center for Philosophy of Science. So I replaced John Norton as the director oh, wow. of the center. And that has been a wonderful experience. Uh, and, so th- uh, and I think that could be relevant for some of your uh, listeners. So these are pe- people who are finishing their graduate education. Uh, we have two postdocs there every year. And if you do philosophy of science and uh, you're looking for a postdoc in an interesting place to do philosophy of science, have a look at the Center for Philosophy of Science science and uh, look at the postdoc. And if you are a philosopher of science, a faculty, we have visiting fellowships uh, uh, um, and uh, you should have a look also. You, you may want to spend a semester here at the center. And also for your broader audience, uh, mm-hmm. we've, we, we've started doing videos, uh, 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 broadcasting some of uh, the fellows at the center and also recording some of the talks which are given at the center. So some of your uh, audience... Oh, think, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I might have come across that. It's like a five... Is that the five-minute fellows exactly video exactly. series? Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can share a link to that. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's a five-minute fellows. Oh, it's I just clicked YouTube. on it. <laughs> And uh, uh, have, a, have a look at it. You'll see some really interesting videos of people describing in five minutes in a catchy manner uh, their, uh, their, their research. Um, and and you know, more, more broadly, the center is trying to um, 
in a sense, find ways to reach out to the broader philosophy of science community, but also more broadly to uh, uh, to the educated uh, people or to, to to your listeners. So ha- have a look at it. That's great. So just yeah. So for those as well, I'll definitely share those videos. But for the so for the Center of Philosophy of Science, so what um, if if folks were to do fellowships there, what they what might they expect in terms of um, you know participation in our community? Uh, yeah. Yes, it's, uh, so one of the goals of the, of the center is actually to create uh, a community of fellows. So every semester we have five fellows plus somebody who is a senior fellow who spends a whole year at Pitt plus two postdocs. So there's nine people at the center who, and we meet twice a week for talks, at least there are two talks a week, plus a reading group, plus additional activities uh, together. So it creates a community of philosophers of science talking to one another uh, uh, on a nearly constant basis. Wow, uh, yeah. So that's a very lively place. And in addition, we are very close to uh, HPS, or History and Philosophy of Science here, and to the Philosophy Department. So there's also all the philosophers of science in these two departments, which are interacting mm-hmm. uh, with uh, the Center for Philosophy of Science. So it's a wonderful place to spend a few, uh, uh, a f- a few months. Uh, more broadly, we're organizing workshops on a, and conferences on a regular basis. So it's easy to just come and start meeting people and see whether you think uh, 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 you, you would want to spend a semester here. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's great. And I noticed, yeah, I'll, so you have uh, any workshops coming up or is there anything? Uh... Uh, yes, I mean, there are, uh, uh, there's a workshop in history of science uh, at the end of the month. One of my colleagues, Paolo Palmieri, has written a book on the telescope and on Galileo. And so we're going to have a debate about his book. And in March, um, uh, Anjan Anjan, uh, Chakavarchi is Mm -hmm. uh, giving, organizing a large conference on pluralism. And what what are, you know, if if knowledge is really pluralistic, if scientific knowledge is pluralistic, what does it mean for various questions in philosophy of science, such as realism, for example? It's going to be a very exciting conference. Fantastic. Well, Edward, I, I don't want to take up any more your, of your time. So just thank you so much for getting to chat just for these li- this little bit. It's, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, having someone uh, uh, such as you on the show has been terrific. So uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been really a, a, a pleasure to talk about all uh, you know, throughout my, my life and oh, yeah, uh, yeah. my research. <laughs> I'm li- yeah, I'm very looking forward to, to your new work and new books. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll cross paths soon. Absolutely. It's a small world. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) All right. Take care, Edward. Thank you. Bye.